So now we're going to look at why the sevening. As you can see up here in Matthew, we had a sevening at 238, which is 91, very prominent number. We're going to have to introduce Paul now. Versus the prior sevening, which is 147. And of course, you add 30 to know what years these are. This is 187 AD. This is 268 AD. And you have to know something of the history. Again, the whole purpose of this is to know what the scripture is saying. It's not to invent something. And in order to know what we're talking about for 2016, I got to go all the way back through the prior years and see what the construction of these meters are to tell me what God is getting at here. So the Lord or Matthew packaging what the Lord says is saying something important happened in 187 AD and something important is happening in 268 AD. So it's like well what is that? And our first stop in figuring out what that is, is we go to Luke, who's playing on the syllable counts and knows what it's supposed to be. And you'll notice the phrase here, not yet is the end. Luke uses different wording, not near, not next is the end, versus upo, upo estinto, a la upo. God, Christ, these are Christ's words, and he's saying, not yet. Wolf ball is what you say to children. You know, when you got kids in the back of your car and you're taking a long trip, and the kids will often be saying to you, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And you say, wolf ball, not yet. Okay, so not yet is the end. And that's at 238. Well, Luke is putting that same text earlier at 189, which is equivalent to 219 AD, they say, not next is the end. In other words, it ain't over yet. But Luke is using slightly different words in order to get the meter to tie to 219 AD, whereas this is 268 AD. Okay, so Luke is bracketing again, using the Lord's own words, but moving them around to 219 because you have to add 30, versus 268, where the same words are used by Christ. Okay, so what is going on here? What's so important about the relationship, and that's what you're looking for, between 219 AD, at the end of the clause, second clause, and 238, which is really 268 AD? Okay, well for that you have to look up your history. And Paul comes in at this point, actually comes in earlier, but it's really helpful. See, here's 238. In Paul, these are, it's a lot simpler to read because it's just straight A.D. years. Paul does some, some fancy tricks with the meter in order to get it to go that way. And I didn't know Matthew or Luke. I only knew Paul first, and this was like six years ago, in 2010, when I did all this stuff on Paul. This is Ephesians 1 9, very important verse. Paul is showing a transition, and he's saying that everything went before, the result of it is the filling up of church. What could be so important that happened in 238, you know, ending in 238 AD, that would bring up this? Okay? And then going further, because, you know, we're comparing 219 to 268. And here we go, 267. So Paul's using 267. Christ is using 268. And Luke is bracketing it by tying it back to 219. Which Paul, of course, also did. Because he's saying that this text is a result of. And that, that ends at 252 AD, which I'm going to explain in a minute. But you see, he starts it, the verse starts here, which is at 215 AD. So 218 AD, 218-19 is right here. At the Eda in Telematos, which means his will. 
Now in Paul, and I've already done this, I've already did the videos on this five years ago. Every time Paul hits Delematos at the Ada there, just that character, it stands for in actual history that he's forecasting, he's predicting, he's prophesying. Every single time this Ada occurs, an emperor dies. And his will, see, telematos means will, his will is undone by his successor. In this particular case, the emperor in question is Macrinus. The prior time that Paul used it was up here. Right here, see? And that's, that's 117 AD. And that's Trajan. Now, you have to know something about the history in order to get the wit here. The will of Trajan, when Trajan dies. Trajan was the guy who brought the empire to its furthest extent. And then his successor, Hadrian, contracted the empire, made it smaller, gave up territory. So the will of the guy dying, Trajan, was undone, reversed by his successor, in this case Hadrian, and the same thing is true here. That's that's why you know you, you're getting the meter right and you're getting the meaning right because it's so precise. At this tele, in Telematos, that's the year that um, a guy named Macrinus arranges to have killed the emperor at the time who was Caracalla, very famous in history. And Macrinus takes over but within a year, Macrinus himself is assassinated, he and his son. So his will is undone. It's Macrinus who dies here at 218. See, because that's the 218 AD, 218 syllable in the, the meter. He and his son are both killed. And the Severan mothers who started up their power up here under Septimus Severus okay it's really started back up here um, Paul's making fun of them here using the word mysterion like pregnancy they come back into power so they undo the will of Macrinus and then the third time Paul does this is I, yet future to what I've been showing you is down here Okay, see here's Telematos again. This is 316 AD and that's when Diocletian dies. There's a big debate about when Diocletian died. But I have an appendix to this thing in Paul where I explain how you can prove, yes, it was 316 AD that Diocletian died. There's a guy named T.D. Barnes. He's a famous Roman scholar. I submit that he misread a Latin clause in Aurelius Victor and so he's thinking that, that Diocletian died three years earlier than he did. And I go into that in this appendix two of this document. Okay. So you can read that if you want. But what I'm trying to show here, the most important thing to get out of it right now, is that every time the Eta is used in the middle of Telematos, okay, you got a guy dying who's an emperor. And his successor undoes everything he intended. And in the case of Diocletian, the guy who's next after Diocletian is Constantine. And he undoes everything that Diocletian sought to, to produce. Diocletian wanted a united kingdom. Constantine ends up splitting it. Okay. So when you see something this satirical and specific... In the meter to something you can check in history. Because remember, Paul's writing all this long before it happens. And then you go back to, because I didn't know about Matthew at the time. You go back to Matthew, and you're looking at 268, bracketed by Luke, with the same phrase. But Luke's going backwards even, to 219. So now we see that Paul... At 219 is using just after the tele because that's 218, so it's a ma. So what's the connection? We know historically when this is. This is when the Severan mothers get back into power. Okay, so they get back into power, 
and Luke is benchmarking the year that they get back into power. It's not the end, but it's going to feel like it. Well, if you go look up at your history at, at what happened when the seven mothers came back into power, they bring back with them their, um, their nephews, and they pretend that their nephews are the children of incest with the slain Caracalla, Caracalla having been killed right here at Telematos. Caracalla was killed by Macrinus, and Macrinus had his year, and he's dead. Okay. So they're playing on the dead Caracalla that Macrinus killed in order to get back into power. All right. So the weird thing about this is, well, why is it seventh? David also died at age seventy-seven. That's in David's own last words in Second Samuel twenty-three. The meter there is about him being seventy-seven. Isaiah repeats that same meter in Isaiah fifty-three. Uh, Luke uses it, it as the 77th son to remind everybody where the meter is. So this 219 is tied to 268. See, you have to add 30. It's tied to 268. Well, what's the tie there? Well, the tie there is manifold, actually. So we have to come down here to Paul again. Because his closest number is 267. And it turns out that this is a really interesting game. <coughs> 267 in Roman history is the other guy named Gallienus, who was emperor, died. But there was more than one emperor at the time that he died. His father ends up dying in Persia earlier. And then the west and the east split again. So you can see why there's there's a tie here. This is the year of the split. Gallienus ends up dying in 267. So 268 is, is marking that event. And Luke is tying it all the way back to 219 and the Severan mothers. Because they had two sons, two nephews. That sort of, they were trying to split the empire also. But the bigger reason... And this, you have to know your history to understand why it's important. The bigger reason, see it says, Ta pante and toi Christoi. To some gather under one head, all trial matters. See, it's talking about a split being made one. Well, that was what was going on. From the seven mothers onward, starting here. Okay, when they get back into power. And this is the time period that covers their two nephews. This begins what Roman historians call the crisis of the third century, where everybody and his brother is trying to be an emperor. And one of them lives for a little while and rules for a little while, and then another one rules in his place. <coughs> Excuse me, because he gets killed. And the empire splits into like four parts as a result of this. So Luke is translating it back to the origin of the problem, the Severan Mothers. Christ is benchmarking it at the end. Okay? But they're both related because the guy who dies at the end of it, Gallienus, right here, and Paul. To some under one head, the thing that's so wry about that is Gallienus was really the only valid emperor left at that point. He was mostly, it, it, the empire had split into four parts. There was all these contending emperors during this time. But Gallienus managed to hold power. And one thing that was distinctive about him is that he was friendly to Christians. So if you had your Bible and you wanted to avoid all that civil war, you went under the territory of Gallienus, which was mostly Gaul. And this will end up mattering a whole lot to the future history. There were a bunch of usurpers and there were a bunch of other guys that were trying to claim power too in Rome. 
But Galienus managed to hold on. They were, you know, sometimes they liked him, sometimes they didn't like him, sometimes they were trying to overthrow him. And what would end up happening is a guy named Carus, when Galienus dies right here at 267, a guy named Carus will come to power. The guy that is named Carus had two sons. And he split the empire between those two sons. And and there was another guy named Diocletian who was under Carus, who was a, sort of like a underling of Carus, who ends up killing the two sons. Okay? There's a debate about whether he actually killed them or he just took advantage of it. And he ends up coming into power here to some gather under one head. Everything about Diocletian, because that was the name of the guy who was under Carus. He dates his own reign to 283 A.D. because of killing Carus's sons. Okay, all that got triggered by Gallienus dying in 267. But the reason why it sevens is because, as a result of the seven mothers, there ends up being all this split going on in Rome. Power split, power argument, everybody going after everybody else. Which means that if you were a believer and you had your Bible with you, you started moving west, out of Rome, up toward Britain, up toward Gaul, where it was harder and the Roman Empire was less concerned about you. And notice that that's a 91. That's a season, season number. See, 491 is equals 364. It's a, it's a joke, and Paul uses that extensively here, see. This will clue me into it. Whoops. See. Okay, this is the first 91 in this box here. So you add up all the numbers and you get 91. That's like spring. Okay. 91. So there's a sort of like not particularly subtle argument here that the Bible gets freed up to its own spring. It begin it's 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 freed up to grow as a result of our boy Gallienus dying or you know ruling in Gaul being friendly to Christians, and when by the time he dies in 268, that which is when Carus actually takes over, um, the Roman Empire split up enough that there's freedom to actually take your Bible with you and actually have a life without Rome controlling you. And all that got started because of the Severan Mothers back in 219, which is why Paul, see, up here, here's his talk, here's his covering of the Severan Mothers. To make known past hidden content. Yeah, the past hidden content is hidden to people who don't, who've never experienced the Bible before. And now it's moving up into the west of Gaul as a result of these two ladies and their scheming with their nephews. Which produces by this point what's called the crisis of the... the third century by Roman historians it starts really about here and it goes all the way through here that's Decius through the end of Gallienus and that's when Carus takes hold and then he's got his two sons and that's when Diocletian is under him and Diocletian schemes against Carus and his sons in order to take control and become emperor okay so you got a window, an exit window, for the Bible to be free that really starts because of this. So see, making known past hidden content. Ha, ha, ha. Paul is commenting on the same text. But it's like, this is what the Lord himself says in Matthew. This is the way Luke repackages it without reference to Paul. And then Paul comes in third to explain the connection okay from 215 all the way down to 283 and, it, and in Paul it's extremely pointed and, and precise about the emperors really pointed and precise 
Luke is just benchmarking it here. I cannot tell if Luke is actually um, pointing you to Paul. He seems to only be pointing to Matthew 24 at its, at its like cause. Again, he's putting the text up earlier and the cause of what the Lord sevens here at 268 when Chorus begins. Okay, so he's taking the story back to a prequel level and he's making sure you know, look, because I'm using the same wording here, when you see the same wording later in the Matthew text, I'm linking this year, which is 268 AD, to this year, which is 219 AD. That whole period is the cause of this period. And then, it, then it's like Paul comes in as the third singer. To, to give you blow by blow, literally. I mean, it was so easy for me to understand what Paul was saying here. All I had to do is go to Deer, that's a, a, um, a website run by um, scholars about the different empires. All I had to do is go to Deer and look up the year and the emperor, and it's like, oh, I know what Paul's doing. It's real easy, okay? Especially with this. Because, see, this is the fullness. He's talking about the fullness of times. And when he gets here to Gallienus, and you find out what it was that Gallienus actually did, you understand, oh, see, he's uniting everything in Christ by sending everybody away from Rome. Protecting the Bible, in other words. So now when I come back here and I find out six years later that this Matthew passage exists and that it's a timeline, it's real easy for me to understand what Christ is saying because I learned it in Paul first and then I learned after the Matthew I went and looked in Luke 21 here and it's like oh Luke is moving that whole same language not yet the end up to a beginning so it's like it's bookended like here's here's the culmination of it when Gallienus dies and everybody's in Gaul, you know, everybody's moved out of Rome now who, you know, wants to escape all the persecution that had been going on in the crisis of the third century. And here's the, here's the start of it. Which Paul had already mapped and I knew it from Paul. I just didn't know where Paul got it from. Where did Paul get all this? Why is he writing this? It was easy for me to tell what it was, but it wasn't easy for me to tell why it was. Well, here's why. Matthew records what the Lord said, Luke updates it to the cause, and then Paul just comes in to say, see, this is what happened. The Lord delivered the Bible. It's basically the theme of it. The Lord delivered the Bible as a result of, in this particular case, Gallienus living to 267 AD, and Christians just moving out. And they moved out because of the crisis of the third century, that's the the Roman historian term for it, which essentially started due to the Severan Mothers, which is depicted here, and ends and ends effectively with um, Gallienus' death and Carus taken over. So that's why it's benchmarked like this in, in Paul, in Ephesians 1, 3-14. So the three texts together tell you what this 70 is about and it's a 70 because God's purpose is to get the word out and so there we go there's our spring season of course in Paul we're already looking at summer because spring spring ended up here at 147 AD that spring and of course summer is a time for war and that's what basically this whole period is about. And so you have the summertime, second 91, all right? And then it has its harvesting result right here. And then that, of course, Christ is already saying here. He's already pointing to it as a harvest. Because the 91 is used. It's just that it's the first time 91 is used so far in what Christ is saying. So you think, oh, that's spring, but it's not. It ends up being summer. 
and it's caused by this in, in Luke. Now I, I've thrown a lot of information at you but hopefully what you're starting to see again and I keep on saying this is oh brain out is actually getting this from something. It's from the Bible that I'm getting it. And I'm deducing based on the history that's transpired because this is a prophetical timeline. If you take this text and you take this text and it's obviously bracketed so this is a cause of what happens here. Alright, what was it that happened? Then you have to go through history and find out what it is. And I happen to have already done Ephesians first. I didn't know about the other two texts. And Paul was a no-brainer to figure out. Because he's just doing A.D. from the get-go. His whole you know, point of departure is, Hi, I'm writing you as if the Lord were 56 when I'm writing. He's really 59. And the reason I'm doing that is because a guy named Varro created a calendar that became legal under um, uh, Claudius. And as a result of that, the three-year era that we have with the 4 BC birth of Christ, they had the same problem. Okay, but it isn't simply just that problem. You can't just push the, push the years forward or push them back. Because there's a doctrinal issue here. Christ was supposed to be born 4106 from Adam's fall, which was 2,000 years after Jacob. But because David ends up dying at age 77, Christ ends up having to be born three years early. So he's using the old official original schedule of when Christ was supposed, what Christ's age was supposed to be when he was writing, which is exactly what Mary does in her Magnificat. So he's playing on the Magnificat. All right? And that's why this thing is so sophisticated and at the same time is so easy because it's like, oh, this is 175 AD, this is 186 AD. And all I have to do is look it up. And so that's how come I knew what Paul was doing. It took me a couple of years just, you know, to do all the research. So now when I get here, I already know what the Lord is doing. Now, for you to go do all that is going to take you some months. Okay, I suggest that you start with Ephesians 1 first. And I, I say that because I've already mapped it out. There's this thing called chrono chart. And all up here are contemporary sources by the Romans, you know, or by Roman scholars. Like that's Momsen. Okay. And you just pick any any year, like right now we're looking at 205 to 215 okay the hidden knowledge to make known the hidden knowledge okay well here's about stuff about Alexander Severus and these are links to books you can read to study the history this would be the easiest place to start is with Paul but Paul's actually third in sequence Paul is crafting his text as a result of at least Matthew possibly Matthew and Luke I can't tell if Luke is doing it independently of Paul or not. Okay, but he is, it's a kind of antiphonal thing. Here's what the Lord says. Here's the repackaging by Luke, going back to cause. And then Paul is the third commenter on the period. And all this is because the believer is always supposed to know what time it is. Here, even if the rapture doesn't happen, you got to know what time it is. If the rapture happens, it won't matter for you. But what if it doesn't happen that year? Well, then you better know what time it is. It's the same thing that was given to the Jews, year by year, starting in Genesis 1. Now, how come the scholars don't know this? They don't know this because they didn't play enough with the meter, even though they knew the meter existed. I have no other excuse for them. Now, do you understand what I just told you? Probably not. I wouldn't understand if it was given to me this fast. But now you know something about where you can look in history, starting with Ephesians 1 first, just so you get the, the sense of the history, and then go back. Oh, here's the Lord doing it at 268 AD. Oh, here's Luke doing it at 219 AD, and he's using the same word, so he means you to bookend. Here's the start of what resulted 
in what happens in 268 AD because the words are the same, so they're like bookends. And maybe when you do that, you'll say, well, I don't agree with you, but now that's fine. But at least you'll know the methodology. Everything about this playlist is about methodology. Whether you agree with it or not, well, first know the methodology, and then you can decide what you agree with or disagree with. But until you know the methodology, you don't know what it might be saying.